Well, we're going to continue in our sermon series titled Jesus Is Today on Easter Sunday. How many of you are glad to be at church on Easter Sunday? It is good to be in God's house with you. One more time, let's just prepare ourselves to hear something from the Lord right now. Would you just lift your hands and say, Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, I praise you. Jesus, your Lord and Savior, we give you thanks, we give you praise. Lord, for each believer in the house right now that's just absolutely free and worship, Lord, bless them as they lift their hands, they lift their voices and give you praise and give you worship. Let's hear your voice. Give the Lord praise, church. Tell the Lord that you love him. Give him worship. Say hallelujah, Jesus is alive. Jesus, you are good. You're worthy of my worship. I love you today. Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to my heart through the preaching of the word today. And Jesus, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that we'll experience some real results at the end of this message and lives will be changed, circumstances will be adjusted by your holy power. Father God, do your work today in Jesus' name. We worship your mighty God and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. God is good. God is good. Today we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1. Our series is titled Jesus Is, and we've talked about Jesus being fully God. We've talked about Jesus being fully man. Today we're going to talk about Jesus being fully alive. And so let's turn to Colossians chapter 1, and let's get ready to read the word together. Now, let me ask a question. What would people say to you if you ask them, what is the greatest event in human history so far? What is the most monumental thing that has occurred in human history? What is the, the greatest feat or the, the highest moment of all of human history? If you went on the street and just started asking people that question, you would get answers like this. The moon landing in 1969. How many of you would say that's a big deal? Humanity left the orb of this planet and went to one of the other orbs and set foot on another piece of rock. I mean, that's a big deal. The moon landing was a big deal, right? Some people would say the greatest event in human history may be the D-Day invasion at Normandy on uh, June 6th in 1944. That's when the tyrannical powers of, of Nazism and fascism were destroyed in the 20th century. That's a pretty big deal. How many of you say that was a big deal? And there were thousands of people involved. Um, some people might go farther back and they'd say, well, I think the greatest moment in, in all of human history is the signing of the Declaration of Independence when the United States of America, one of the greatest nations that's ever existed on the, the face of the planet and the history of humanity was formed. And uh, for all of its faults, America is a great place. And aren't you glad that you live in America this morning? I am. And so some people might point to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Some people would go even further back and they'd say, well, I think it was the discovery of the Western Hemisphere. Well, if, if you chose that one, there'd probably be somebody that would argue that someone else found it before the person you thought that found it. And then in the, the next person that would argue for that would have someone else argue that someone found it before that even, whether they were uh, uh, of Indian origin or whether they uh, were uh, Norsemen or who, uh, finding the, the Western Hemisphere is a big deal. It's like somebody found a, 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 a no, whole new half of a planet, right? And that was kind of a big deal. There are all kinds of things that we can point to, but I want to suggest something to you today. <clears throat> I, believe, I believe that the greatest event in all of human history is the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. I believe that's the greatest event in all of human history. And some of you are like, oh, you have to say that. You're a pastor in a Christian church, and you preach Jesus, and you've studied the Bible all your life. You're that, of course you're going to say that. Well, you know, I know a lot of rocket scientists well, I don't know a lot, but I know a few. I literally know a few. I know a few rocket scientists that would say the resurrection of Jesus is a greater event than us landing a man on the moon. And I've got a great uncle that lives in Southern California that was a part of that project, and he loves Jesus. And I would dare say, he'd say the resurrection of Jesus surpasses the landing of a man on the moon. And I believe that there are some historians that uh, really value some of the things that I mentioned that are historical facts from the past, but those historians might still say the resurrection of Jesus tops the other events that were mentioned because it was a, it was, it was a victory that was won for all of humanity, for every person in all of history. It's, it's powerful and it's effective for every person in all of history. The greatest event in human history was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it proves. The resurrection of Jesus proved that Jesus was God, that his words were true, that he lived a sinless life, that his death on the cross 
was to take your place and my place for our sins to be forgiven and to be covered. And it proves that his words were true. Jesus promised several times to his disciples. He promised, I'm going to die on a cross. And in three days, I'll rise again. He said that several times to his disciples. And yet when it happened, his closest friends, his 12 disciples were like, what? What happened? They're still stunned at it, even though he promised it to them verbally several times. Matthew, in the book of Matthew, I'm getting off my notes here a little bit, but in the book of Matthew, there are five times Jesus promises to his disciples, I'm going to die. And three of those five times, he tells them that he'll rise again from the dead and tells them exactly how many days it will be between his death and his resurrection. Man, we can trust Jesus' words because Jesus made a promise and he kept a promise that was humanly impossible to keep. Only God could do that work through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so today we're going to start by talking about Jesus' resurrection. We're going to start with Colossians chapter 1. And so I want to ask you to stand to your feet. I'm going to continue doing this, this particular sermon series, just so you kind of pay attention and you capture all the things that are in this passage of Scripture about Jesus. Jesus is fully alive, and we see in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus is fully God. We see that he's fully man, and here today we're going to see in Colossians chapter 1 that he's fully alive. Listen to the Scripture today that talks about Jesus. Verse 15 says, the Son, the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Catch that. He's the firstborn among the dead. That means there's more to come. He's the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood. So God made Jesus the reconciler of all things through his blood. Okay, listen. That blood was shed on the cross. Verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd just add your blessing to the reading of your word as this word tells us about the everlasting Son of God who came to live among us who became a servant. He lowered himself to humble himself, to become a servant and give his life through death on the cross. And he has been lifted up and glorified and made alive so that we might be reconciled to God by faith through the work that he did for us. Father God, thank you for what this scripture shows us and tells us. And Lord, let it, let it come to life in us today and make our hearts ready to hear what we're about to hear about Jesus being fully alive. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. amen. You may be seated. If you're a true Bible-believing Christian, if you believe the Bible and you're following Jesus, there's a few things that I think you need to understand from the scriptures and even from the scripture that we read, but from many other scriptures as well, that we believe some things. We believe and we could never deny the divinity of Jesus. He is fully God. If I'm a true Bible-believing Christian, I can't deny the humanity of Jesus. He's fully God, but he became fully human just like you, just like me. Everybody say, just like me. He became fully human. We cannot deny his resurrection. 
that he died on the cross and that he rose from the grave, and we celebrate that today on Easter Sunday. And we cannot deny that he has ascended to heaven, and he is glorified. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and in his glory, he is coming again. Next week, we're going to talk about his glorification. So what do we know about the resurrection of Jesus? Let's just cover four quick facts. What do we know about the resurrection of Jesus. And then at the end of the message, I'm gonna run through six quick implications. This is what we know about the resurrection of Jesus. What does that mean for us this week? So we're gonna talk about what do we know, what are the facts, and then how does this apply to me or why does this matter to my life this week? So what do we know about the resurrection of Jesus? Number one, we know that Jesus of Nazareth died at the hands of Roman executioners. We know it. Some people are like, well, Jesus didn't really die, and so there really wasn't a resurrection. The Roman executioner who was in charge knew that Jesus was dead. Listen to how his words are described in Mark chapter 15, verse 39. And when the centurion, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. I want you to notice a couple things here. This is a guy who, for a living, kills people. I mean, this guy knows when people are dead, right? He is a Roman centurion. He is in charge of the squad of soldiers that are not only assigned to kill Jesus, but they're also assigned to kill these two other criminals. Sometimes they're referred to as rebels. Sometimes they're insurrectionists. Uh, Sometimes they're referred to as thieves or murderers. They had broken the law and they had conspired against the Roman Empire. And so the Roman Empire killed them. And this guy's job was to execute them. He knew when people were dead. Is everybody with me today? I mean, he wasn't new to this. It probably wasn't his first time around. And when he saw what happened, he recognized that something different was happening here. He saw how he died. And his statement was, this man was the Son of God. He's like, it's done. He is dead. I also want you to see that at the cross was one of Jesus' best friends, a guy named John, the disciple that Jesus loved. And the Bible says that John knew that Jesus was dead. Listen to what John said about his own eyewitness experience at the cross. He said, but when they came to Jesus... These Roman soldiers, they wanted everybody to die a little bit faster, and so they went to the first criminal, and they saw that he wasn't dead, so they broke his legs so that he would hang heavier, and he couldn't push up, so he would suffocate, hanging on the cross. They went to the other criminal, and they saw that he was not dead, and they broke his legs so that he, too, would suffocate. When they went to Jesus, they found something different. When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead, and these are guys that kill people for a living. They saw that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and this testimony is true. Who's the man that saw it? It's the guy that's writing this. His name is John. John said, I saw this happen. And here's what I think happened. When that soldier stuck that spear into Jesus' side, he, he's like, he looks dead. He seems dead. I think he's dead. Let's kind of be sure. And he took that spear and he shoved it into his side. It probably pierced a portion of his lung. And then it pierced the pericardium that surrounds the heart. And because he is already dead, the blood and the water had separated in his veins and in his heart. And so what came, in, what came flowing out of that wound was blood and water mixed. You could see that his blood was already coming apart because he'd been dead for some time, hanging on the cross right there. And so the executioner and Jesus' best friend knew that's what it means to be dead. This guy has passed. So we know that Jesus of Nazareth died at the hands of Roman executioners. Number two, what do we know? We know that Jesus' closest friends and possibly even his mother buried him in a cave and left him for two nights after watching him hang on the cross on Friday. Now, if you had a son or if you had maybe not like your best friend, but at least a friend, And that friend was like really beat up bad. Like they were seriously wounded. And you thought, you know, they're kind of alive. I think I could bring him back. Would you 
throw him in a cave for two nights and leave him alone? Nobody would do that to their friend, right? But Jesus' friends did that with his body because even his closest friends understood he's dead. He's dead. And I want you to see something. There's a friend named Joseph of Arimathea. He lived in Judea, just outside of Jerusalem, this little town of Arimathea. He was a rich man, and he happened to have cut a tomb out of a rock face, and he had prepared a place for himself to be buried. But he realized that Jesus, this itinerant preacher, had no preparations for his burial. He's a poor guy, and so he needs somewhere to be laid. Here's the old, uh, here's the old custom in the first century for even uh, decades before Jesus was born. This is the way the Jewish people buried people. Instead of burying them in the dirt, like some of you are like, why'd they put Jesus in a cave? Why didn't they bury him in the dirt? Because like when you and I think about somebody be, be, being buried or someone um, after they've died uh, being put into a tomb, we think of earth like you dig up dirt and there's a vault and a casket and that sort of thing. So why didn't they do that? That was not their custom. So their custom was a little bit different. They would take the individual who had died and they'd wrap that person in linen cloths with spices so that it wouldn't smell too bad. They didn't embalm, but they wrapped in spices. And then they'd take the individual and they'd put them in a cave. And then they would wait a year for the flesh to deteriorate. And a year later, there would be a burial ceremony where the person's bones were gathered and they put their bones in a bone sarcophagus. It's very, it, it, it's, it's archaeologically proven. That was the tradition. That's the way they did things. As a matter of fact, the high priest, and I've said this to you guys before, you can go online and look it up yourself, and you can find it in the Archaeological Study Bible and things like that. But uh, the high priest Caiaphas, who was the high priest that allowed Jesus to be crucified, and wanted Jesus to be crucified, archaeologists have found his bone sarcophagus. There's a book that D. Copians loaned me uh, several years back, it's very interesting, about James, the brother of Jesus. And this hasn't had all of its provenance done, but uh, some people believe they found the bone sarcophagus of the brother of Jesus, James, because they found a, a bone sarcophagus, and it's about the right size, and it has an inscription on the outside that says James, the brother of Jesus. Well, how many, how many Jameses were there that had a brother named Yeshua in the first century? I don't know, but that's pretty cool. That, that they found that. And, and bone sarcophaguses in Israel are not uh, unusual things to find because it was so common in that day. Hey, here's another little side, side note. So Jesus uh, has a guy come to him, and, and, and Jesus says, come follow me. And he's like, first, let me go bury my dad. Now, do you get what, he, what just happened here? Now that you understand the custom, you realize he's not saying, he's not saying, my dad just died and we got to get his body in the ground like in 24 hours because then pretty soon he's going to start to stink. That wasn't the case. What he was saying is, oh, I'd love to follow you, Jesus, but I'm not done with that year. Like, give me a couple months because I need to go, I need to wait till it's time to move my dad's bones. I'll, I'll follow you in a few months or I'll follow you after the ceremony's over. See what he said? Jesus is like, no, let the dead bury their dead. There's an urgency to what God is doing right here. You need to come right now. And so that's why he said that to that young man. So now you understand that. And so they took Jesus' body and they put it in the tomb. But listen, they knew he was dead because they did all the things that you would do with a dead person. And it was his friends who were doing this to him. Listen to what the Bible says. As evening approached, Matthew chapter 27, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea, his name was Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, going to Pilate, the Roman governor, Joseph asked for his body, and Pilate ordered that it would be given to Joseph. Joseph took the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and he placed it in his own new tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. When Jesus was buried, Joseph of Arimathea is kind of the main character. Joseph is his friend and disciple. He knows that he's dead. Pilate agreed, he's dead, you can have the body. Like, Pilate gave the seal of approval. It's done, Jesus is dead. Then watch this. Mary Magdalene and Mary were present at the cross with Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
And these ladies stuck around all the way through the execution, all the way through the removal of his body. They followed to the tomb. And when Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus and whoever else was with him buried Jesus, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, there's all these Marys in the Bible, right? Because Mary is the name Miriam from the Old Testament. And um, how'd you like to be the other Mary? <laughs> Which one are you? I'm the other one. <laughs> Uh, but, but Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they're like sticking it out. We're going to stick this out. I mean, we're going to be with Jesus until we can't see his body anymore, until they roll the stone in front of that cave that's been cut out of the rock. And so they stuck around. And these ladies, they know where Jesus is buried because they're there. They're present when he's being buried. Now listen, if, if they were good friends and they thought Jesus wasn't dead, they wouldn't put him in a cave and leave him there for two nights. Am I right? The, the, the good friends of Jesus, people that loved him, knew that he was dead. Pilate knew that he was dead. Friends offered no medical care. They buried him. What's the next thing we know? We know, number three, that 11 disciples, several women, and two other people saw Jesus alive on the Sunday after he died. He died on a Friday. He rose from the grave early Sunday morning. And that Sunday, during the day, that many people saw him alive. Eleven of his disciples, some of the women, Mary, Mag Mary Magdalene and Mary are among them, and then two other followers as well. Let's look at what the scripture says. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10 says this, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week. You ever wonder why we have church on Sunday? It's the first day of the week. And as Christians, we've made it a weekly celebration. I mean, we celebrate Jesus is alive on Easter Sunday, but we make it a weekly celebration on the first day of the week that Jesus is alive. And so we have church on Sunday. And so after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, so they were there when he was buried, they went to look at the tomb. Is it possible that they went to the wrong tomb? Possible, but not likely, because they'd already been there once, just a couple days before. And not a lot has taken place since their last visit to that tomb. There was a violent earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, the angel rolled back the stone and sat on it. What, what a victorious thing to do. Just like, eh, I'm going to have a seat here. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him. There were Roman guards placed there because the Jews were afraid that someone would steal Jesus' body and claim that he rose from the grave. The guards that were there to guard the tomb under Pilate's orders were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. So the, the guards are on the ground in fear, and the ladies are like, oh, an angel. I always think that's kind of funny. <laughs> do not be afraid, ladies, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. That's past tense. He used to be there. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and they clasped his feet and worshiped him. They grabbed a hold of his feet. They touched him with their hands. So they fell at his feet and they worshiped him. Jesus' physical body was alive and present when he rose from the grave. And these ladies touched his body in their first experience with the Lord. Later that day, here's what I find interesting. Jesus told the ladies, go run, tell the disciples, go to Galilee and I will meet them there. Did Jesus meet the disciples in Galilee, he met them later that night in a locked room. Why? Because the disciples didn't go anywhere. I think they were still doubting what was happening here. They're so stunned that when the news came to them from the ladies, go to Galilee, I'll meet you there, they're like, uh, what? And they just like were stunned. They were like paralyzed in a little bit of wonder and disbelief. And so they locked themselves a room in a room, and they didn't go anywhere. And so Jesus, I can just see, I know this may seem a little bit trite, but I think Jesus was like, okay, I'll go meet you here then. <laughs> and so he met them in that locked room, rather, and then later they were actually in Galilee, and there's other stories about that. 
But here's what happened. Throughout the day, Jesus appears to these two men that are walking on a road to Emmaus. The, the same day, two men were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had happened in Jerusalem that weekend. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. They walked a little further. He described all the scriptures to them, and he explained how Jesus would fulfill all the Old Testament scriptures, and they're just amazed at what he was saying. And, and then they stopped at a little place to get something to eat, and when they stopped to eat, Jesus broke bread. And when he broke bread, they're like, whoa, this is him. This is Jesus. Suddenly, they did recognize him. They got it. They're like, oh, the guy we've been walking with, he's alive. But everybody said he died on Friday, and they recognize that it's Jesus. They're in awe and wonder, and then Jesus immediately just disappears from their sight. They're so stunned at this experience that they run back to Jerusalem. So forget going to Emmaus. I don't know what's in Emmaus, but they gave up on it. They ran back to Jerusalem, and they went to the disciples, and they're like, we have seen the Lord. We have seen Jesus. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us when he talked to us about the scriptures? Didn't that make sense to us? Didn't it seem like this is real? This is happening. He's alive. And so they went back and they told the disciples about it. And then the Bible says in Luke chapter 24 that while those two friends were talking to the disciples, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. John describes it in John chapter 20 and he says, Jesus stood among them, just miraculously appeared there among them in bodily form and, and he's alive with them. And he says, peace be with you. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Think about it. These people now believe that Jesus is their Lord. They've called him King. They've called him Lord. They believe he died on the cross for their sins to be forgiven. They believe he's alive. They are ready to be New Testament believers like you and me. And as a New Testament believer, God grants you the gift of the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And so at that moment, when they know that Jesus is Lord, Jesus died for their sins, Jesus is alive again, when they see him with their eyes and they put their faith in him for real because they see him alive, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a gift. Isn't that good news, church? How many of you are glad for the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you? The Holy Spirit of God is with you because of Jesus. And then he began to describe the scriptures to them, and he helped the disciples understand all that God was doing. Jesus appeared to a bunch of people on that first Sunday and proved that he was really alive. Here's what I think is so interesting about the ways that he proved he was really alive. We know he was body, bodily alive because he was physically touched, because he ate food with people after he rose from the grave, and he held conversations with crowds. So he's physically alive. People touch Jesus. A few days later, Thomas wasn't there. Remember I said there were 11 disciples? It's not just because Judas was gone. Actually, there were 10 Thomas wasn't there, and Thomas is like, I don't know if I believe you guys. And they're like, Thomas, we saw the Lord. He's like, I'm not believing until I get to touch him. I want to touch his hands, they have the nail prints in them, and I want to touch his side where the spear pierced him. Then I'll believe. I I'll believe when I see and when I feel his resurrected body. So a week later, Jesus shows up and he says, hey, Thomas. Thomas is like, oh, no. And he's like, come here, Thomas. He's like, Touch my hand. Thomas touched his hand. He said, put your fist in my side. And Thomas put his fist in his side. He said, my Lord, my God. He's like, I believe. And I just want you to see that Jesus was touchable. He was, he was alive, fully alive. Everybody say, fully alive. alive. He's fully alive when he rose from the grave. I think that he proved it by allowing people to touch him, and then he proved it by eating with people. So the people were startled when they saw Jesus at first. And they thought, they listen to what Luke chapter 24, verse 37 says, they were startled and frightened when they saw Jesus, and they thought they'd saw a ghost, thinking they had saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet, it is I myself, touch me and see. He welcomed that people would touch him. Touch me and see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed him his hands and feet, and they still did not believe because of joy and amazement. They're just like, what? And so he's like, do you have anything to eat? And they had a piece of broiled fish. And how many of you like broiled fish? 
Okay, I don't know if I've even ever had broiled fish. Uh, I like fish, but I don't know if I've had it broiled. He, they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it in their presence. He's like, okay, I'm hungry. Let's eat. I mean, Jesus was fully alive. Do you guys see what the Bible's telling us here? I think these eyewitness accounts are intended to help us understand that Jesus is fully alive. Jesus reminded people that he made the promise that he would rise from the dead, and he invited people to touch him and eat with him, to converse with him, study the scriptures with him, so they would understand that Jesus is fully alive. Is everybody with me today? And I want you to know something. Jesus, who was and has always been fully God, became fully human to be with you and with me so that he would die on the cross for your sins and my sins to be forgiven. Little sins like lying about stealing a cookie out of a cookie jar and big sins like lust, greed, adultery, envy, and hatred. I mean, he died for it all. And he took your place and my place because he loves us so much. And then he rose from the grave so that the life he has now, he will share with us. Because he lives... I can live. Because he's alive forevermore, I will be alive forevermore by my faith in him. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. And Jesus proved to us that he was fully alive. So what are the implications? Let me go quickly here. Is everybody ready to go fast? Is everybody ready to have a great Easter? All right, come on, hang tight, hang tight. So number one, some implications. I want you to know today, Jesus is not dead. I mean, how simple is that? He is not dead. He is fully alive. He is alive right now. I mean, sometimes I think that we think about Jesus historically because he did live a human life 2,000 years ago, but I'm telling you, Jesus is alive right now, and he is still fully human right now in heaven with our heavenly Father. Jesus is not dead. Number two, Jesus is not past tense. When we talk about Jesus, sometimes we talk about the things that he has done And we can talk about the things that he has done in past tense. But when we talk about Jesus, we talk about him in first tense, in present tense, first tense. We talk about him in present tense. And you almost kind of betray yourself as to what you believe in the way that you find yourself talking about Jesus. Do you say that Jesus is alive or do you say that Jesus was alive before he ascended into heaven? He is alive right now. When you talk about Jesus, do you say that Jesus forgives sins or do you say that Jesus forgave sins? Jesus forgives sins right now. When we sing the little song, we don't say Jesus loved me. We say Jesus loves me. And let me tell you something. Jesus loves you right now. Why? Because he's alive. Is everybody with me today? When we talk about Jesus, we talk about Jesus in the present tense. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Jesus loves you right now. Jesus is good. Is everybody with me? And it's worth worshiping him in the present tense because he is alive. Number three, third implication. Jesus is not a ghost. Jesus himself said, I'm not a ghost. He is not some disembodied spirit. He is physically alive right now. So I'm going to borrow Tyler. So come here. You get to be the illustration. Front row, right side. You're going to be awesome. So, okay, here's Tyler. Is Tyler alive? Help me out here. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, you might not hear all of the responses in the room here, but uh, I'll help you out a little bit. So how do you know Tyler's alive? Somebody shout one thing out. I can touch him. He's smiling, and it makes you want to smile too, doesn't it? Yeah. Doug, you don't ever not smile. But his smile makes you smile as well. Okay. How else do you know he's alive? What else? He's breathing. Yes. (laughs) He's breathing. (laughs) What else do you know? He can move. move. He's moving. (laughs) What are you going to do when church is over? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He's going to eat. You're probably going to eat with some people that are in this room, right? I assume so, yeah. I assume so? Uh oh. That's probably a good assumption to have. So we got all this evidence that he's alive, right? I mean, you see him right now. You are an eyewitness of the life of Tyler on Sunday morning, the 17th of April in 2022. How many of you would say, I am an eyewitness 
and from now on and forever, I'm an eyewitness of the historical fact that Pastor Paul drugged this poor young man onto the platform to prove that he is alive today, right? Yeah. Now listen. The eyewitness testimony, no, hang tight. <laughs> the, eyewitness, the eyewitness testimony of the disciples who saw Jesus, just like you see Tyler right now, was so sure that every one of them gave their lives for their eyewitness testimony. They're willing to die to say, no, Jesus is alive. We, we saw him alive. He was breathing. We touched him. We went places with him. We traveled with him. We talked with him. We ate with him, because we're going to have lunch. We ate with him, and Jesus is alive. And they were so sure of their eyewitness testimony that they're willing to go to their deaths. Now, give Tyler a hand. Thank you for being up here. I want you to see something in the Bible. In the Old Testament, all of the preaching was about a promise that would come. All of it was about a promise. When Jesus was here and when John the Baptist was preparing the way, it was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was an announcement of fulfillment, and Jesus was the fulfillment of all the promises that God had made for thousands of years in the Old Testament. But after Jesus rose from the dead, all the preaching is witness. I saw it, I saw it, I saw it. We are witnesses of these things. We cannot keep silent. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit when the power comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. I just quoted that scripture terribly, but, Rome, but Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says you'll receive power when my Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In the book of 2 Peter, Peter says, we did not preach to you some myth or some made-up story, but we preach to you what we have seen and heard Come on, somebody say amen. amen. These people had seen and heard the risen Lord. They knew that he was alive. They had experienced him for themselves, and they were willing to die for that testimony because Jesus is not a myth. Number five, Jesus is not going to die again. Jesus is fully human, but he died on the cross once, and he will not die again. Romans chapter 6, verse 10 says, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, once for all, but the life he lives, get that, he died past tense, but the life he lives, present tense, he lives to God. And let me tell you something, he lives it for you. He lives it for you. Notice his death was past tense, but his life is present tense. Hebrews chapter 7, 27 says, unlike other high priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of other people. He sacrificed for the sins once when he offered himself on the cross. Jesus paid the price, and he's alive today. Jesus and any other person, any person who's put their faith in Jesus is going to live forever with Jesus who is living forever. Is everybody with me today? Because he lives, I'm going to live. Because he lives, I live. Is everybody with me today? And then number six, Jesus is not going to keep this to himself. This is gonna get all over the place. Jesus is not gonna keep this news to himself. In Matthew chapter 28, he said to the ladies, go quickly and tell the disciples he's risen from the dead. In Mark chapter 16, he says, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. See the place where they laid him? Now go tell his disciples and Peter, who thinks he's never gonna be loved by Jesus again because he denied him. No, 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 no. Even tell Peter that he needs to check this out. Peter and John went running to the tomb and they saw the empty tomb for themselves. Luke chapter 24, Jesus told them, this is what is written. The Old Testament tells us that the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and then repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations before the end will come and it'll begin in Jerusalem, right where you guys are living. Mark 16, 15, he said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Jesus doesn't intend for any of this to be kept quiet. The whole world can know and should know that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is alive. Now, can sometimes when you're preaching that Jesus is alive, can sometimes someone look at you and go, huh? Yeah, 
They can't because what are we used to? We're used to people living and then people dying. Think of all the people in the Bible that maybe experienced the resurrection from the dead. What happened to all the people that God miraculously raised from the dead in the Bible? What happened to them all? They died again. But Jesus has been raised to never die. And there's a day coming when as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to raise you up too. Somebody say amen. Amen. He's going to raise you up too because he did not make you for a second death. He made you to live forever with him in harmony, reconciled to God through his blood and his body that he offered on the cross. That is God's will for you. And God is good, isn't he? Let's stand to our feet today. God sent his son Jesus so that you can be saved today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the time for you to choose him. This is an acceptable day, a pleasing, a great day in the Lord's eyes for you to choose Jesus as your savior, for you to be saved, for you to be forgiven, for you to have eternal life, for you to experience the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's a real experience with God. And let me tell you something. Those witnesses that saw him with their own eyes, those are not the only witnesses of Jesus. Thomas believed when he got to touch his hands. Remember that guy I told you about? Thomas believed when he got to touch him. And Jesus said, blessed are you because you believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us. I haven't seen him with my eyes yet. Notice I said yet. I haven't seen him with my eyes yet, but I believe because I've experienced him. And when I, when I heard the word preached, the Holy Spirit did something in me, and I felt conviction for my sin, but then I felt unbelievable relief when I was forgiven, and I felt unbelievable strength when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of me, and I felt the direction of the Holy Spirit in the days that followed almost immediately. It was an experience with God Almighty an experience through Jesus Christ that made me into a modern witness. And now I'm a witness too. I have experienced him for myself. I've experienced his love, his power, his conviction, his cleansing. I've experienced his help. I've experienced his comfort. I've experienced his love. I've experienced his a miraculous direction. And let me tell you something about preaching today. I believe that when, when we preach the gospel at Livestream Church, we fulfill Old Testament prophecy because we are accomplishing what the Old Testament said would happen in the, in the people of God. Second, we're fulfilling the prophecies of Jesus. This gospel will be, pre, 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 blah, blah, blah. This gospel will be preached to all nations, and we're doing that. People are hearing about Jesus today online and in this room. And then number three, I believe that when I'm preaching, that there will be real results that you will have an experience with God. There will be a demonstration of the Spirit's power in your life. And you won't put your faith in Paul or Livestream Church or anything that we do in this room. You won't put your faith in this group of people, although this is a really good group of people that I think you can trust. But let me tell you, I don't put my faith in Livestream Church. I put my faith in Jesus Christ because I had an experience with Him and I've had a demonstration of His Holy Spirit's power. And so my faith is in Him, not in other stuff. And that's what I believe are some real results that we can experience in this room. In a few moments, we're going to pray. And you can experience salvation, and you can experience all those things that I just described that that you will experience when you experience Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Number two, I believe that in this room, we can experience miracles. There should be real effects that follow the preaching of the word, that when people pray for healing, there's healing. And God can fix your sickness when we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? Second, When you pray for provision, Jesus wants to be your provider, and he wants to meet your need today. And so when we pray, I believe that following the preaching, there will be miracles of provision. Third, I believe there will be miracles of wisdom and understanding and and illumination from the Holy Spirit as people pray about the perplex problems, uh, the, the difficult problems that they may have in their life. God wants to help you, and he wants to grant you wisdom today. And so we can experience the answer to prayer when we respond to the preaching of the word. Is everybody with me today?
I'm going to invite the musicians to come to the front. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's get ready to receive what God has for us now that...